Hey there, spacefarers. I'm Pruitt, and this is Jim Davis, apparently engaged in a laser pistol battle. I have my photonic cutlass at the ready, and today we're gonna talk about science fantasy on the web media. Photonic cutlass? Just call it what it is, man. It's, but I, le legal said we couldn't use. This episode is sponsored by Nord Games. They've got an awesome Kickstarter going called Treacherous Traps for 5th Edition. It's got a beautiful book with over 250 traps for 5e D&D and a random trap generator that makes thousands more. And trap card decks to take on the go. The campaign ends on January 22nd, 2019. Link here and in the description. This isn't your father's science fantasy. I mean, it might be. I mean, it's more, probably more like your grandfather's. Grandfather's, right, right? right? Maybe old dads are cool, right? Like They're already pretty chill. Sure, but they have the good books. So. Science fantasy <laughs> is my favorite uh, genre of fantasy because it is a irresponsible and delightful merging of these two genres, mm -hmm. with often, very often in the in the literature at least, not a lot of thought given to how science and magic and and the supernatural and all that sort of fit together. It's just thrown together and no explanation given or very little explanation given. The genre itself comes out of the pulp magazines of the 20s and 30s and, and going into like the golden age of science fiction in the 30s and 40s. And it's contrasted with the more hard sci-fi stuff that, that's trying to be scientifically plausible and explore like yeah. future developments of science, but not necessarily supernatural. Yeah, yeah, let's, let's, let's talk about the distinction between that, between like where you cross that line from science fiction into fantasy, like how, like. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, it, we're here and, and you have on one end, you know, media properties like say Star Wars or Star Trek even, you know, Star Trek, use that example, there's uh, an attempt to have a patina of, of, of sort of scientific explanation to things, mm -hmm. extrapolating on what certain technologies might do for the society and whatnot. But there's also godlike beings that, that are just, right. that are just, you know, they're there, right? The Q continuum alone. Right. What do you need <laughs> as an example for your otherworldly alien uh, you know, near gods, uh, you know, the Q is not a bad uh, model to, uh, to follow there. So, and they've got that, and, and a lot of the technology is, is sort of either hand-waved or, or given a, you know, a nod of some kind. Yeah, it's given usually a sentence of techno babble sure. in the show. Tech you know. tech. Yeah, whenever you have to, you know, route the secondary buffer unit. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, obviously they're talking about something there, but does anybody really know how a transporter works? Or is it just a teleporter? Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, yeah, there's a lot of figuring out how all this works, what the implications of it are, and whether or not there's actually stored copies of every crew member on board and no one needs to die. That's one end. And, and, and you might even, we might, it, it's at the furthest enough end that you could still argue it's more like soft sci-fi or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. You know, if we have science fantasy here and then it's like soft sci-fi, hard sci-fi, and then of course we're over here in the fantasy, and then there's urban and low fantasy sci-fi you know it, like a lot of things i, I like that it, it exists in this weird liminal space between genres because it means you have a lot of room to play and and have a good time and for me because the genre is so hugely influential on the the development and birth of our hobby you can see elements of of jack vance edgar rice burroughs uh and a lot of the, uh, the the science fantasy authors that uh, were real prominent in Gygax and Anderson's time, you can see that that all of this is imprinted on Dungeons and Dragons, at least, and a lot of the er other earlier uh, role playing games. It feels like a refreshing turn to the original inspiration, and and I find it a, an infinite wellspring of ideas. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned a couple, but let's go through some more of those examples that kind of, like you said, like defined. Mm -hmm. uh, what what D and D would at least start as? You know, these are settings where um, scientific explanations and and the principles uh, of of sort of our understanding of reality and, and the world are present and 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 form a baseline. But the laws of physics are routinely broken. There are mm -hmm. supernatural elements or, or un completely impossible or, or inexplicable elements. And I think the, the big difference between a lot of these settings and, say, like science fiction as a, as a genre itself is that science fantasy really deals in the impossible. Yeah. Uh, time travel, faster than light travel, all these kinds of things are accomplished with relative ease. <laughs> and, and depending on the genre, it's, it might just be something that the characters routinely engage in. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not a, a big deal at all because there's either super science involved or that, that wonderful Arthur C. Clarke quote of mm -hmm. any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. They, 
they really lean into that. The big one, like the you know, piece of media that, that defines it is Dying Earth uh, by Jack Vance. Oh yeah. It describes a world that's set millions of years in the future. Oh, yeah. the, the sun has not gone supernova and burned up everything on the planet, but is instead sort of like shrunk to a red dwarf star or something like that. Yeah, it's, it's what's gonna happen right before it the massive expansion. Slowly shrinking in, using up all of its fuel, and it's very dim in the It's sky. very dim, there's no more moon, yeah. you know. It, it's, it's a world which has both experienced the height of civilization and is now at the, the depths of, of that collapse and also about to end permanently. Yeah. The characters in the book are deeply cynical and decadent, and, and most of them are not nice people. <laughs> they're, yeah. they're not particularly good role models. They're anti-heroes. They're jerks to each other. They Cudgel's kind of a dick. Cudgel's more than kind of a dick. His antagonists are, are even worse. And there are things in Vance that never get explained and, and are yeah. just sort of like sprinkled into the prose and, and are just left as these little nuggets of inspiration that you read them and you're like, this is worthy of its own short story. You know, magicians and would-be magicians and pretenders and ne'er-do-wells and vagabonds. Mm -hmm. It's the start of Vancey and magic and spellcasters. In the dying earth, they use syllables and 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 gestures to tap into the power of magic, which is itself a product of sufficiently advanced science, which is why mathematics and knowledge of the science is sort of seen as a foundation for being able to perform magic. Mm -hmm. But only the most powerful magic users and magicians are able to cram like four or five spells in their head, maybe more of the, the lesser powered ones. Yeah. Now they are like big showy flashy the most excellent prismatic spray is like it will kill anything and it's a big huge like you know big effect it's not like a just an attack they get in each other's business they're petty they're stupid they're they're like they hold grudges these wizards do and mm -hmm. there are stories where it's like oh the witches from forty thousand years ago are kidnapping a bunch of time traveling to the future kidnapping a bunch of mages now turning them into women, going back in time, we gotta stop them, which requires us to get in a spaceship and go to the near edge of the universe to pick up a bunch of magic rocks, oon stones, or ayun stones, as you probably say. Stones. One minute you're a wizard summoning demons and, and, and teleporting across the world, and the next minute you're in a spaceship traveling through the stars, yeah. visiting other dimensions. Uh, it, it, it's a glorious and riotous mix of genres and does not give a crap <laughs> whether you yeah. find it internally consistent or plausible or anything. It's so fun. I, yeah, I absolutely the, love it. The story where the traveler finds the like completely automated, pristine city. Yes. Uh -huh. And then he finally finds the inhabitants of it, but uh -huh. it's like after much searching mm -hmm. and there's like the sidewalks that move, the move and the escalator, and, yeah, mm -hmm. and, you know, and it's just like, oh, Oh, you've you found a super advanced city and yeah. no, nobody lives here. Oh, no, there are some people. There are some people that live there. The setting itself and the cynicism that's in it, that appeals to one side of me. But the other side of me, it is, an, it is a world ripe for adventure. The characters as they move about it are, are exploring this dangerous place full of a bunch of fatalistic nihilists who are like, yeah, well, we might die next month or it might be another million years, but the sun's not getting any better. Yeah. Why even try to do anything? Yeah, why make this whole place better? <laughs> right. um, like, I wonder how much he thought the uh, collapse of Western civilization was, <laughs> was, uh, was in route and <laughs> that informed his writing. And a lot of these were written system. during World War II by uh, by Jack Vance, who was, I think, like a, in the Navy or something. I don't know, you know, a lot of those sci-fi authors were in the military. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, of course, right. Tolkien himself okay. was in the, in the military during World War One. So war informs a lot of, the, uh, of these stories. But I bring it up, number one, it has a huge influence on Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, Vecna is an anagram of Vance. Yep. Uh, the, the whole way that magic users and spellcasting works in Dungeons & Dragons is inspired by uh, these stories, uh, particularly the first uh, collection, The Dying Earth, Tales of the Dying Earth. Yeah, Tales of the Dying Earth. Earth. Other things... Uh, moving on from from Jack Vance uh, would be something like the Barsoom uh, stories, a, a Princess of Mars, John Carter of Mars, oh, yeah. uh, by Edgar Rice Burroughs. John Carter is a Civil War veteran who stumbles into a cave, and wakes up on Mars, yeah. and this is a Mars with like six-armed and six-limbed giant green Martians, and there's white apes, and they fly around in great big airships, and and it has that same sort of feel of of, of a mix of fantasy and science fiction and. I guess technically a princess of Mars and others belong to the sword and planet subgenre of science fantasy, which is near as I can tell is just there are swords. There's swords there. That's what makes it sword and planet, which I Isn't the old, that just science <laughs> fantasy though? Like 
Right. Well, know. it's like a subgenre, right? Yeah, so, like, like, I don't know. Like, everything has genres and subgenres and everything. But, you know, I mean, there are fantastical elements, there are scientific elements. If it has a sword in it that worked for me when I was five and it works for me now when I'm an adult. And, and you can use that, that, that kind of template, right? A, a person who's from another planet, another culture, is not, does not have the, the knowledge base for the technology that they're visiting, does not have the knowledge base for if there's any magic or something, but is somehow psychically or magically or, or whatever transported to another place mm -hmm. and so like maybe if you're running a science fantasy type game you have that as a background maybe that's what your far, far traveler, traveler right yeah. like from uh, sword coast adventurers guide that's what it using, sounds like to me right uh or, or something like that or your background is like yeah i'm not from around here i'm, I'm <laughs> from somewhere else and maybe that imparts some sort of special uh power or ability on you for john carter he's strong and fast and whatever because he's from Earth. He came and, from Earth gravity, right? Right. He jumped like 80 <laughs> feet. And he's, right. you know. A Wrinkle in Time uh, by yeah. Madeline Lingle is a, is a really cool science fantasy story where, to me, it, it really blurs those lines between what is technology, what is magic, how are these celestial beings that, that come down to help these children, what exactly are they doing, who are they? It, it, it has a, a magical feel to it, yeah. but it, it feels also at the same time grounded in science and, and, mm -hmm. and and uh, begins in scientific principles and then grows outward into the fantastical. Yeah, yeah. And, and that, that, it's that mix of those two things that, that really inspires me because these sorts of stories allow dungeon masters to bring in more elements to mm -hmm. inspire them and, and to, to get their creative juices flowing. Whereas if you're running just like traditional science uh, fiction, which is, you know, it's, maybe it's interstellar or intergalactic or something like that, uh, or you're running like a traditional fantasy game like mainline Dungeons and Dragons, and and you know, we're not gonna, we're not, we don't even want smoke powder in this. <laughs> you know, yeah. like we can't. I want even pistols just... up in my swords, yo. Yeah, and I mean, there's more than just books, though, right? Like, oh, uh, uh, there's there's a plethora of television movies. More recently, like like Thor Ragnarok, sure. for me, is a beautiful like just showing of science yeah. fantasy. He's rolling in a fucking god <laughs> right. who just lost his magic hammer. Yeah. Which you only find out later is like, oh yeah, well when you make something from Dwarf Star, you yeah. know, it's just really heavy. Sure, but sure, it's got sure. magic on it, sure. But then later he's picking up laser guns with Loki uh -huh. and I mean yes, it's all, all of that place. It's all of that there. They're flying that, around please. on spaceships, but there's yeah. also Pegasus. Maybe not Pegasus, but you know, whatever the whatever it is the Valkyries ride, because Pegasus is Greek. But I <laughs> there's a don't, don't want to mix those pantheons. No, we cannot mix those pantheons. We can pantheons. mix genres all fucking day, Jim davis anyway sorry yeah i'm sorry no, it's all right it's okay it's language. all right no it's okay we'll be all right like thor ragnarok uh you know a, a reskinned guardians of the galaxy those are oh, yeah. are, are are fun ones because in, in those you're dealing with cosmic beings on such a scale that they break that they 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 get to that arthur c clark the, the third law of uh, one of his third laws there's only third law you know they are sufficiently advanced technology right what are the infinity stones right like they're they have presumably some basis in scientific uh, yeah. explanation. They, they, they manipulate forces in the universe mm -hmm. that are scientifically observable or at least sort of theorized, but it's clearly magic. <laughs> like, well, yeah. Literally snap your fingers and your will is enacted upon all of creation. And I, I look at a movie like say Thor Ragnarok and my first thought is like, I gotta give my players like an M60 or an MG42 or, or something like that. They need like just a big belt fed machine gun Mm -hmm. Maybe they get like a hundred bullets or two hundred. Yeah. Like that's it. You're well, just you, gonna you get gave that them much. like a grenade launcher already, I, right? I gave them a Rob Liefeld style laser cannon and land between two rivers. They used it a couple of times before the druid and the party destroyed it in an act of kind of contrition and and, and yeah, repentance yeah. for for embracing uh, technology. But yeah, I gave them a, a Liefeld gun. Like one of those that you can't tell which ends what. Yeah, <laughs> you have to be careful the first time you right. pull the trigger. Right. So you don't end up like that uh, Colorado Buffalo's uh, mascot who shot himself in the nuts with a yes. t-shirt gun. You know, that's from Land Between Two Rivers, which yeah. is obviously, for me, my science fantasy gonzo sort of setting par oh. excellence. Oh, yeah. When I think of science fantasy, I think of things like Thundar the Barbarian oh, and, yeah. and He-Man and Masters of the Universe. Mm -hmm. Thundar, they're literally running around the ruins of North America with, like, dragons and a sun sword yeah. and a whole bunch of, you know... Heavy metal. Yeah, heavy metal. There's, yeah, heavy metal is another one if you can, if you can stand... Uh, heavy metal <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's there but he-man is one of those right he-man is a, a property that is 
you know, ignoring the, the kids cartoon, which is a kids cartoon and has the aesthetics of a children's cartoon, the, the sort of a concept of He-Man as this barbarian warlord on a, on a ruined, desolate planet that is threatened by a maniacal lich-like sorcerer who, who itself has these other, you know, Evelyn and Merman and Beastman and all the others, you know, th th this menagerie of... <laughs> Uh, Pro is going to lose it. This menagerie of uh, of, of wicked henchmen and the yeah. like, uh, and and facing against him is this sort of brawny, uh, you know, you know, Conan esque sort of character yeah, with his with own all his minions, right? All his minions, uh, and and when I look at that, I go like, nah, that's that's D and D A F. Like I, yeah. I I gotta have that in my D and D game. Yeah. I gotta have that in my fantasy game. I'd rather have that. It inspires uh adventure in me and action and and play and all that as opposed to a more traditional tolkien style mm -hmm. fantasy which to me is very contemplative and and it doesn't uh spur action and, and adventure yeah. it's more well we could easily just sit here for 80 years talking about you know malar or whoever you know what i mean like <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> That's or maybe be. like uh, Thundercats. You got a bunch of Debaxi running around with their technology. I mean, like we could just yeah. like let's just pick all. We'll take all of the Voltron. Saturday Saturday morning eighties I mean, and nineties cartoons. Voltron is a big one, and like the reboot, right? Like on Netflix is like how is that not science fantasy? Well, they you know? they talk about how it's a scientific wonder built with magical means. Yes, or a magical wonder built with scientific yes. means. Yeah. they use those two words in the same sentence. Yeah. which yes, if you're gonna build a giant robot made of five other robots. There's got to be some magic involved. Yeah, we can talk about why science fiction and fantasy are, are sort of put aside from from other uh, fiction and, and literature. And we can talk about why... They're uh, seen as silly sometimes. Silly sometimes. They're not a literary theorist. I just play one on YouTube. So I... Well, if you theorize about literature, you're a literary... Sure, I'm just not a trained one. You're not literally I'm just irresponsible, literal, literal literary theorist. Yeah. Uh, I'm just an irresponsible one that likes to run his mouth off. You, you take these things, and I love the fact that they that they bend the rules, that they mix genres, that they are not easily defined, that things about them are unknown and 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 in some in that sense dangerous and and enticing to me. Mm -hmm. Whereas the more traditional stuff, the more traditional fantasy stuff is safe. It's known. It's it's uh, static. Yeah. And science fantasy feels dynamic and, and and with action. But just kind of round it out before we get into like all of the role playing games <laughs> that that yeah, we can we'll call science there. fantasy is uh, Ralph Bakshi's Wizards. Ralph Bakshi is a, a, a an, an animator and sort of film uh, film creator, and and he's done a, an adaptation of Lord of the Rings, yeah, yeah. Uh, Fire and Ice that he worked on with, with Frank Frazetta. If you're a fan of live action and, and cartoons together, then he's uh, he's got to check out if you if you haven't heard of him before. But Wizards is one where it's like these two brothers who are wizards in this war-torn post-apocalyptic world and they're fighting against each other and somehow Nazi propaganda makes it into there. It, it's like magical Nazi propaganda that the evil wizard uses. And mm -hmm. it's, it has an aesthetic to it that I really like. I, I, in a lot of the, these movies, the, the aesthetics of them are really fun. The, the, the images that they use. Yeah, they're the evocative. They play, they're yeah. evocative. But like I said, science fantasy has had a huge influence on the hobby. Uh, overall, not just dying or right. When you take the fact that these are that this is a, a blended genre, and then you go, all right, well, how many RPGs could this apply to? How many different types of? Yeah. And it gets to be like ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, there's, about there's, there's, there's a there's been a bit of a renaissance. I would right? say so. Yeah, because, I would. Because I mean, Spelljammer came out in the early '90s. Yes, and Spell it did Jammer not do early. well. It didn't. Spelljammer okay. lacked uh, res didn't resonate with the audience at right, the right. time. There was something about it, uh, and in and Spelljammer is a, a weird kind of. Uh, of setting to take in the first time you see it. And mm -hmm. I, I do think that like overall the, the nerd culture and the geek culture since then has progressed where the conceptual space is, is, is available for something like Spelljammer. Because right. it's really awesome. And, and the thing that I love most about it is it, it takes a medieval cosmology, the phlogiston and, and, and spheres and yeah, all yeah. this other stuff, yeah. and a medieval understanding of the cosmos and goes, let's just adventure in that. Yeah, like, that sounds fun. Let's make that real, <laughs> and how would that work? Maybe, right. maybe that's what it was, is there was an extra buy-in. It wasn't just like, oh, we're in these ships, and they allow us to fly around in space. Yeah. It was, 
oh yeah, we're in these ships and they allow us to fly around in space, but we have to first leave our crystal sphere that floats in this mm -hmm. this miasmic, you know, yeah. whatever. And by the way, don't light a cigarette out there. Don't light a cigarette out there. And, and the, the, the distances are still the same, right? Yeah. Like they're still dealing with astronomical distances, yeah. uh, which, you know, for some players that, that, that just breaks their suspension of disbelief. Um, you know, for others, you know, they don't, yeah. don't really care. Why don't they just teleport a plane shift there? Sure, right. Well, that's like, difficult. Well, uh, that's um, difficult as well. It's the same plane. You can't plane shift. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so there's others there, right? Like in original D&D, &D, uh, we have a, a lot of influence from Barsom. You can travel to Mars. A, a lot of the uh, the aliens and monsters that are on Mars appear on random encounter tables in original D&D. &D. And it's sort of similar with, uh, with Vance. There's the Iron Stones, the way magic users work and the like. Mm -hmm. um, and but magic items also. Magic items, a lot of magic because items. They, that's the, one of the first fan stories, that, that fight by the pond. The fight by the pond. The boots mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. he casts the thing and yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of, yeah, and to loop back for a minute to, to uh, Vance and Dying Earth, a lot of the magicians there, they might know one or two spells, but they also have like, you know, they might have six magic items that they use mm -hmm. as well. And so there's... Uh, it, it, all attuned. All all is, right, and, and, and that's all reflected in the original game, right? Mm -hmm. The original game, magic users have the ability to use a lot of different kinds of magic items, and it's assumed that they'll have wands and scrolls and stabs and all these other things that assist with the fact that they only have a handful of spells uh, yeah. early on. Moving on from that, there's Tecamel or Empire of the Petal Throne. It's another highly detailed, uh, exhaustive world from another linguist. So we've got Tolkien, who's like looking at Indo-European languages mm -hmm. and developing, uh, you know, his own fictional languages out of that. And M.A.R. Barker is over here looking at languages from like Southeast Asia and, and, and other parts of the world that have a different linguistic heritage and then spinning off and making his own sort of languages based on that. And then this role playing game setting sort of comes out of it. Uh, and it's. It's weird. It's one of those where it's like in, in the distant past of this world, it was a pleasure planet with, with like a luxury resort, sort of like a, what is it in Star Trek? Riza. Riza. Mm -hmm. And yet this galactic empire it's a part of collapses, leaving it isolated and alone. And they don't have a lot of natural resources. And they, 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 they kicked all of the native inhabitants of the planet and they put them on like, basically put them in like concentration camps, right? Mm -hmm. And so that they break out and, and you know, seek their uh, revenge and then other aliens come. And then like 10,000 years later, here we are on this planet where the people, they don't remember they came from the stars. They don't yeah. remember this, but they live amidst the ruins of this intergalactic civilization that they themselves have, have uh, built a new civilization on top of. And I think like that's probably my favorite genre trope of the science fantasy is... A science, it, this world used to be science fiction, and through calamity, disaster, something, it's now a fantasy setting. And so the, the remnants of its technological past are still around. Uh, Wilder Lands of High Fantasy is like this. You can find gravitational sleds and orbital AIs and all these other kind of things there. But it's mostly about fighting orcs and giants and dragons and shit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so... Uh, and and I, I, that's sort of why I like that that style because it's um, it's a different way to present the cosmology and I do think there's something to be said for like you know this world used to be a highly technological place and now it's it's not so much you can use a lot of that imagery from like uh, Horizon Zero Dawn where it's like you know ivy covered ruins and uh, yeah all and, that kind uh, of stuff and, and, and all the tribes around with pieces of metal worked into their headdresses <laughs> and their their garb and their right. weapons and their weapons and, and things like that yeah, yeah. and they, they find things uh, that are maybe like advanced metals and they know that they they are harder metals yeah, and yeah, they're yeah. sharper but they don't know why right do a lot of fun things with this Warhammer 40k is science fantasy yep um, fighting it, orcs it, with power swords sure and, and <laughs> using, using the power of the warp to uh to, to traverse the astronomical distances mm -hmm. um gamma well, all, all because of the emperor's light <laughs> all okay. because of the emperor's light all because of the crazy emperor um a gamma world and it's uh it's modern incarnation of, of mutant crawl classics which is an amazing game uh it is another one of those where it's sort of wacky weird gonzo and all there's a the it's, <laughs> all you play a, a sentient plant uh, <laughs> it's, uh you, i'm pretty sure you probably play a sentient cloud of gas uh, which would be really 
<laughs> I was he who was dealt. Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that, you're right, that, that's I'm your gonna next write. mutant crawl. Uh, yeah. classic character. He who was dealt. Um, and so it's a fun one. I, I, I like using uh, mutant crawl classics, at least for my uh, Land Between Two Rivers game. The mechanics in that ported over to, to 5th edition. And of course, we uh-huh. mentioned Spelljammer. And guess what? There is an actual Dying Earth RPG by Pelgrane Press which has a ton of really awesome spells in it with really evocative names, mm-hmm. rules for uh, you know playing all six t- different types of wizards <laughs> in, yeah, yeah. in the setting. Uh, and, and it's just fun. If, you, if you're a fan of uh, Jack Vance and the Dying Earth, then tracking down the, the Dying Earth RPG is, is worthwhile. But. Yeah, and there's also, uh, there's been a, a run of recent ones, yep. Uh, yep. a couple of which I've played in. Starfinder for Pathfinder. Sure, Starfinder. Mm-hmm. Uh, which, that was a lot of fun. I only got to play in the one time, the uh-huh. premiere. Gods, uh, magic, sci blasters, spaceships, yeah. all, all yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. b- Big, crazy alien races. Um, there's Dark Matter. Sure. Which is a hell of a lot of fun. Fifth edition sort of side. It's the fifth edition supplement. It's mm-hmm. coming out soon. I mm-hmm. uh, got to play on that from uh, from Mage Hand Press. Uh, have not played Esper Genesis yet, but yet. I do like the rules for that. It feels yes. more like Mass Effect to me. It does. I, I think I might use like Esper Genesis to do more like soft sci-fi. Yeah. Like, definitely a Mass Effect game. But yeah. I mean, I might still use the, <laughs> you know, particularly for, uh, you know, my setting of Lamb Between Two Rivers, which is fifth edition, mm-hmm. then just like going over to Esper Genesis and like, oh, here's what, here's some stats for blasters or stats for whatever. You should, that, you should check out uh, really Dark fun. Matter also. Yeah. Because the, I like well. how they do blasters and rifles, like where you don't add your modifier, but they do more damage. Gotcha. Gotcha. You know, you're doing like 2d8 or 2d10, but yeah. you don't add your dex modifier to damage. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're going to be fine. Because it's just a big um, ray gun. Yeah, it's a big ass yeah. ray gun. And yeah. then the, the other one is the Triumvine setting, which oh, I, yeah, yeah. I really like the lore of that because it's like a kind of a system agnostic. Like it has its own, but it's meant to be like kind of agnostic. Yeah. Because basically, one of the big things is kind of the, the dwarf type people made a computer. Right. And once they made the thinking <laughs> machine, the calculating machine. Right. Everything changed. Everything changed. And so sure. you can play before that, so you can play more fi- more fantastical, oh, cool. or you can go right after that, or you can go far into the future. There's like three nice. different kind of levels to play on. I, I really enjoyed it. I liked uh, I liked all the the new races, the Impala people and the bird and armadillo yeah, people, the yeah. big polar bears. Oh yeah, yeah. I, and like it's the same with like Starfinder to me. Yeah. Like I, I'm Pathfinder and Starfinder are not games for me. Um, but I love the the They're setting really, of it. Really the, crunchy. The, I love the setting of it. I love the uh, the races of it and and the kind of taking this fantasy world and doing sort of the opposite, right? Like yeah. they're, they're taking a fantasy world and turning it into a sci-fi world as opposed to like Tecumel or Wilder Lands of High Fantasy. And then of course there's like what, Numenera? Numenera is science Numenera fantasy. Is and, fantasy yeah. and it's, you know, it, it's got all of the tropes. I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, it's partially inspired by Gene Wolfe's uh, Book of the New Sun, I think is uh, what it's called. I haven't read it, but I, I know it's an, in this sort of genre of the dying earth and, mm-hmm. and science fantasy stories. What is it? They have the data sphere? In, yeah, in there's the a data sphere uh, uh, and, and uh, you know, the, the remnants of prior civilizations that, are, that function in the same way that dungeons do uh, in, in Dungeons and Dragons. And then a, a, a great thing, if you're not <clears throat> actually playing Numenera, but you want to borrow something from it, is the concept of a cipher, which is a one-use... Yeah. magic item uh you know it, for me I, i've used them in lamb between two rivers as just saying like this is a spell scroll anyone can use it, yeah. and then i describe it as uh as a piece of technology or a thing or or a weird sort of like yeah you have to crush this thing up and, and rub it on your skin or, or something that now you have stone skin now you have stone skin or and, and, and temporarily but it allows uh non-casters number one to unlock that concentration uh, slot uh, and also gives them something fun to do. It's a one-time thing, and you can throw out like a ninth-level spell effect for you know as a one-use thing, and just have some fun with a ninth-level spell at like mm-hmm. you know fifth level. Yeah, uh, I, haven't <laughs> to, I haven't had the balls to do that in my spell jamming campaign. You want to throw I'm, a, I'm, a time I'm, stop? On yeah, for I'm, your... I'm getting there though. I'm getting there. It's like why not? Who gives a crap? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, just give give your players a meteor swarm scroll at first level and see what kind of fun they can well, do with it. What I'm waiting for my players to figure out is uh, all the weapons that they're using are using these crystals that are basically like from the ethereal plane that are transitory in nature. Mm-hmm. So when they when you roll a one and you roll a d20 again and roll a one again, they explode and everything within a 10 foot space 
could get sucked into the ethereal nice. plane. Excellent. Whether you die Excellent. or not, you get sucked into the ethereal plane. Is it because it's basically just a little doorway that you're you're tapping open, and uh -huh. energy comes out as you open ah, up this yeah, portal. Yeah, yeah. There you it's, go. That's why you have the, the actual like hammer <laughs> trigger. I haven't really explained that before, and I hope they don't watch the show and figure that out. But we'll see. <laughs> Who um, knows? But there's others. Obviously, uh, steampunk and the like technically falls into the same genre of science fantasy. But Eberron? I, I Eberron poten is, potentially is leaning there. It leans mm -hmm. there, right? It, it's getting it's getting there. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think I really do see like steampunk and stuff is sufficiently different enough that, that we would talk about it separately uh, later. But there's tons of cool stuff uh, that that you could draw from from there for your uh, particularly as you. You start like if you want to run a game in yeah i mean so you take all this stuff so. and how do you implement it in your game i take a big page from jack vance in this in which vance sort of early on in one of the books sort of explains what magic is and how it works and the different types of spells that magic users can cast and and, and, and it really powerful magic users basically summon genies to do things for them mm -hmm. uh, all, all the time the lesson <laughs> learned by all powerful men Delegation. Delegate someone else to do it for you. Uh, yeah. and, and, uh, but then they, they back talk, and it's not pleasant to be around yeah. them. Well, the yeah. genies, that is. Mixing of magic and technology is the hallmark of, of science fantasy here. Science, technology, and magic. Personally, I think keeping those lines fuzzy, of not nailing down the details, uh, of, of having your players, uh, you know, if you're, if you're wanting to run a, a science fantasy setting, having your players like, well, I, I think this is a spell, I think this is magic, particularly if they're from a, a, a time or a place where it's sufficiently advanced technology does look like magic, never explain the difference to them. This can be as simple as like just reskinning a magic item uh, to, to say it's like, oh, well, this is really more like, uh, you know, this wand of magic missiles is, is more like a laser pistol. Yeah. Or this, uh, you know, a helm of telepathy is a contraption that you, you know, you have to have electrodes to your brain. And it's a few dials and buttons mm -hmm, on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, the, and, and maybe instead of attunement, it requires a battery of some kind that you're constantly having to scavenge for or, or scrounge for or something. I, I took a, a wand of fireballs and made it a Rob Liefeld gun. <laughs> you know, just, uh, uh, and, and, and that was, that was it. Um, yeah, I mean, for yeah. my laser pistols, I just started with them one of magic missiles. Right, I changed right, right. the damage a little bit, yeah. but that's it. There it is. If you're talking about fifth edition in this case, fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons, there's, uh, you know, there's stuff in the DMG that you can use, playing in different time periods, and then of course there's all of these other, uh, you know, Espergenesis and, and Dark Matter and and uh, you know other fan conversions and things that you can use to sort of borrow your mm -hmm. stuff. And a lot of this t t comes down to how much time do you have? How much do you want to prep? Um, how different do you want to make technology from magic? Do you want to make them like, uh, you know, distinct and, and, and truly separate? Or do you want to, you know, just blend it and, and we'll see, you know, what, mm -hmm. what, what, what happens. It, that, that idea of, of ancient technology disguised as magic, though, there are a lot of concepts there that you can play with for your games and, and, and sort of like build a game around or build like a settlement around. You mentioned earlier, like the data sphere mm -hmm. and it being, you know, surrounding the entire planet. And I, I always wanted to try a game where nano sorcery was a thing mm -hmm. you know that the, the the world is is filled uh, with with nanites you know microscopic you machines inert nanites just mm -hmm. floating you breathe them in and out all they're the all place. over the place they yeah. permeate nearly everything and and, and millennia ago these uh, constituted a, a global network of machines that nearly anyone with the right uh, you know, genetic cyberware or whatever mm -hmm. could could uh, could use yep. organic circuitry or whatever you want to come up with. And now it's only a handful. And so maybe those are your sorcerers. Maybe yep. those are your clerics. Maybe those are or whatever. Maybe maybe being a warlock is finding the command codes and and a, a console or terminal of some kind to contact the orbital AI gods who have gone crazy in their yeah. in their eons of isolation mm -hmm. and now really do believe that they are worthy of, of, of sacrifice and devotion uh, and the like. And they will impart with you, within you the, uh, the secrets of commanding the nanites all around you to, to do various and sundry things. Yeah, which, which basically, in my head, I see that warlock going to a computer terminal, accidentally entering the right access. Basically, you register yourself. It sure. scans your eye, your retina, and your uh, fingerprints. Yeah. And now it has you in the system as a registered user. Sure. So you have access so to So you have access nanites. to it. And yeah, that's, yeah. That's it, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But you have made a pact yes. with your patron. Yeah. Yeah, um, uh, and and that's how Mutant Crawl Classics does it. Uh, they they have AI patrons. Uh, there's a there's a series of adventures known as the Anomalous Subsurface Environment, which is set in a 
post-apocalyptic science fantasy world where powerful wizards command armies of steel leviathans and cyborg soldiers and things like that and mm -hmm. and goblins are, are you know little hairless gray skinned you know white-eyed little mutant morlocks <laughs> that that are remnants from the last civilization yeah and, um and so like that that's another orbital ai gods uh sci the, the cult of science is, is another big one right like whether it's the um uh, you know whatever they're called the tech priests in 40k or the uh you know any other number or the aeon priests in, in numenera mm -hmm. you know the 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 taking of science and technology and, and making a religion out of it is often a trope of these settings so maybe you do something um uh, something like that yeah, yeah. Uh, to to touch on that point of having like a the whole nano nanite uh, armies and stuff a good a good book to draw uh from it's one of my favorites by neil stevenson mm -hmm. A Diamond Age or Young Ladies Illustrated. Oh yeah, fight. yeah, yeah, definitely. It's sure. there's, I mean, there's not really any fantasy to it. It is yeah. a science fiction book, but right. the descriptions yes. of how nanotechnology can be implemented because it's kind of what he does. Right. Amazing. It's really and cool. I want, yeah. I want to make a Numenera character based off of stuff from that. Book. Oh yeah, yeah, like when they're making the island in the middle of the sea and uh -huh, it's like sprouts the, the, the yeah, yeah, but just also like the Chevelines, the the basically the electronic horses mm -hmm. that fold up into a briefcase right. and then you go into your office and you leave and you, you put it down and kunk, 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 yep. and you get on your metal horse and ride away and it you know travels at a hundred kilometers an hour and. Um, and just and skull guns. I mean, yeah. having a having a part an skull inch gun. square of your skull cut out, and you have a, a gun put in with like three different types of ammo. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know that kind of shit. Yeah. It's like you know, set your neck whenever you whenever you do it, and because it's gonna kick. And right. Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, a little burp. But yeah, like that. <laughs> that it just. Oh man, I want I want to make so many characters based off of stuff. It really is, and I mean, like I, we've we've mentioned before about how science fiction, both for Pruitt and myself, is uh, a a bigger source of inspiration mm -hmm. for our campaigns and adventures yeah. than fantasy is and i my favorite thing to do is to take something like a science fiction scenario that i see in a movie or a tv show or something and translate that to a, a fantasy setting because mm -hmm. in, in my personal opinion I, I find that that science fiction grapples with the implications of the setting elements more so than fantasy does yeah. That there's a lot of things about fantasy where they're they're so stuck with this medievalism as as needing to be an inherent part of the genre that they can't say like well I you know all of this magic around must surely change the society that we're a part of in some way right you would hope so but it really I, I mean at least in RPGs I really think it's it's uh, Eberron I think Earth Dawn maybe I, I'm not that familiar with it but I know that that Earth Dawn is a setting that really tries to work through the implications of the, the supernatural elements that it that it uh, introduces but Eberron's another one of those where it's like yeah we're gonna we're gonna work through what mass magical technology means mm -hmm. and and how uh, how that would impact society um, there's there's like maybe there's a couple more things I'd like to just touch on I mean, we don't have a lot of time left and I know that our viewers will be upset about at least one of these. We didn't dig in deeper. All right, hit me, Jim. I, but the crashed spaceship dungeon uh -huh. is a staple of this. And Expedition to the Barrier Peaks, which is an early D and D module, is an example of this. Right? This is, I think, I might be wrong, but I think this is the first instance of a mind flare, or one of the earlier instances of a mind flare. And it's got a laser gun and is dressed in like the art, at least, it sort of looks like a spacesuit. Mm -hmm. uh, and and this is just there's a, a spaceship crashed in a mountain range and you have to kind of go search for it, but you, you proceed through it as if it were a dungeon yeah. and the challenges you overcome are, are similar, but the, the skin is different. It's a spaceship. Yeah. Right, right. I love that. You love I want, that. I mean, we did that in your Numenera game kind of. Yeah, we did one early on. Well, oh, I, we sorry. did we did a yeah. Gamma World game. It was a I'm where sorry, it was you Gamma guys, World. Yeah. We we I was using uh, the uh, Dictionary of Moo, which describes Mars in the far future as a science fantasy uh, setting, and uh, you know you guys had escaped a gladiator prison mm -hmm. and, and found a crashed spaceship. One of you was infected with nanites that would heal them. So we're basically like turning Wolverine. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah fun with that. Like, someone had like cut a, yourself right like i use like uh, right digital weapons from 40k which look like just jewelry but actually shoot out powerful lasers and yeah, things yeah. like that and you know I, i'm and then you guys overthrew the yarl of spiders and and uh, uh secured position at octon lake before uh, mm -hmm. for, so we went we, into a nice trade of glass yes the one thing i remember <laughs> is we were like this glass is as hard as steel let's take yeah, all the panels right you guys really just like took apart the whole ship <laughs> yeah. after dealing with the defenses uh 
So that's one, that's sort of a, a, a genre a trope there. And I do believe Expedition of Barrier Peaks is getting an update for 5th edition D&D &D, uh, pretty soon. Maybe it's going to be in Dragon, I think. I don't know. Who knows? It might already be out. Uh, is that anything to do with what uh, Chris Perkins just tweeted out? With the, I uh... don't know if it's related at all to uh, the un Under Mountain, the Dungeon of the Mad Mage. Who yeah. knows? Yeah, who knows? There's an illicit captain there yeah. with a spell jammer. I have a question for you, Pruitt. Psionics. Psionics, man. Let me tell you, if you don't have psionics in your science fantasy, then what the hell are you doing? What it's been there the from doing? the beginning. Sure. Whether it's, you know, I mean, Star Wars. Yeah. That's psionics. That's it's science. just, there's a force that allows certain people to use psionics. Sure. I love, I love it's that. Called it's called the <laughs> We're just gonna, we're just gonna stop that right there. Everybody just take a deep breath. I kind of like that. Again. Well, yeah, but it goes back ahead, to what you were saying, saying is don't over-explain everything. Sure, don't over-explain everything. I, you, know, you, I, take the, you take the mythos and the mystery out of it. Qui-Gon Jinn's like an anti-vaxxer. You know? Everybody like, rolls his eyes. And, oh, God, Qui-Gon. Anyway. Qui <laughs> Psionics yeah. need to be in there. There yes. needs to be that, that weird, like, whether, whether, it's, whether it's just a race of people that can do it or it's a technology that allows it or, or, or an alien race that can do it. It doesn't matter. It right. needs to be in there. Yeah, right? I, I, I do I do agree with that. And I do think that I'm sympathetic to those DMs who are like, no psionics in my game. It's too science fiction. Right. Uh, but I, at the same time, I, I like a fantasy world that has a lot of different mystical techniques. Why wouldn't you have both, uh, you know, psionics, which is a mastery of yourself in order to produce these sort of effects uh, or magic, which is understanding something external to you, even if you're a sorcerer or yeah, something. It's, it's a mastery of the external. Yeah. It's mastery of the external, and so I, I, I really like, uh, I, I also kind of like the way that, that, that 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons explains psionics, which is that you are psionically manipulating the forces of magic. Yeah. And so that's why Dispel and Counterspell can, can sort of work on psionic effects uh, and, and not have to have, you know, a whole set of spells just for dealing with psionics. I kind of like that, though. I, I kind of like the reverse of that. I sort of like that, like, oh, crap, we're facing a psionicist? Like, okay, we gotta go find our specialized spells to deal with this. And similarly, they might go, oh my God, there's an arcanist over there? Like, how in the world are we gonna deal with that wall of force? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Uh, it can affect the man, not the effects that right. he uh, puts at you. Yeah, yeah. and so I, I think that uh, having psionics and having magic and having maybe different kinds of magic and, and having it all in a big, just a big stew of concepts and ideas and just let it all break down and get mixed up together. And you're a, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I've practiced the psionic techniques of the golden tower and mm -hmm. as well as been versed in the hundred spells of the last realms of men. And you know, that's, how is that not a D and D character? How is that not yeah. a character that you want to play in a game, you know, regardless of the system, I, that's the sort of, uh, that's what sets my brain on fire when it comes to science fantasy. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, I said, we're going to have to do a full show on psionics one day. Oh, we're going to have to definitely yeah. do it. We're going to have to now. By the way, my, my, my gas, sentient gas guy, he who was dealt, yeah. he's a smelter. <laughs> Head on over to Patreon for our weekly podcast and so much more. WebDM is also on Twitch with three weekly games, which we upload to WebDM Plays, our second YouTube channel. To see, need to see a die of clearance in between you. Come on. What's this? What's Look this? What's this? Look at that. Sorry. Just had to break up some, break up some dice. street toughs.